to tie a knot and then you're gonna kind of wrap the paper around but you gotta make sure you cover all the angles right that way I might need this piece of paper <laughs> just in case keep folding it around and once you run out of paper which I'm really close to doing that you're gonna tuck it under and pinch the sides. Yep, definitely. So once you get it tucked under, pinch the sides, and hey guys, what are you making? Making paper stars. 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 And boy, why? So what do you guys got on your trees? I got a star. What do you have, Eli? An angel. Awesome. They both represent. Christ's birth. You had the angels that spoke to the shepherds, and you had uh, the stars leading the magi to Jesus. How's the making of the stars going then? Pretty good. We just finished them. What do you think? Oh, they're so cute. They'll go on my little Christmas tree. Thanks, guys. Hey, everyone. This is Rochelle here. I'm so glad you could come back and join me today in part three of the Incredible Christmas. If you recall in part one, if you had the chance to watch, we talked about the angel visiting Mary. And part two was an invisible me where the shepherds, they are, they were considered invisible. And today we're going to be talking about the Magi's. Believe it or not, there was a time when people did not make superhero movies. That's because the technology didn't exist to make superhero stories as big as they needed to be. Superheroes had big battles, fighting against supersized villains. They could fly. They had cool toys like the Batmobile. Their battles could level buildings and cars and even whole cities. 30 years ago, they couldn't do any of the big battle scenes that you see in the Marvel movies. And if you tried, it just looked cheap and corny. Computer and computer special effects has made it possible to create new worlds and battlegrounds that look and feel real. Now we can tell a superhero story the way it was meant to be told. And it's amazing. Superheroes have incredible powers that they use to fight evil. And seeing superheroes using their powers leads to some innovative questions. Who will win the fight between Thor and the Green Lantern? Who will win the fight between Superman and Batman? Who will win the battle between the Avengers and X-Men? Sure, they're all good guys, and thank goodness they are on our side. But you can't help but wonder who is the most powerful. In the time of Jesus, it was believed that the kings were the most powerful men. Some people even believed their kings were gods and worshipped them. Kings had entire armies at their command. The word was law. If a king got an idea for a new law, guess what? It was a new law. And if you disobeyed the law, you could face the punishment. You may have noticed a group of kingly men in your nativity scene at home. Today we're going to read about these three kings, better known as wise men or the magis. And one more king. I want you to pay close attention to how they respond to the baby in the manger. Hi, Kim. Hi. What are you doing here? Well, I finally found my Bible. Oh, yeah. Where are we supposed to be at? I think Matthew, but you know what? It sounds easier. <laughs> We're in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading of the priests and the teachers of the religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among ruling cities, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people of Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for a child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. 
After this interview, the wise men went away, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Wow, thanks, Kim. That's totally what we're talking about today, about the three kings. Thanks for reading that for me. See ya. I know you have things to do. Yeah. The Magi's were not actually kings. They were called wise men because they were great scholars. They studied math and science and astronomy and philosophy and for many centuries. They were the wise counselors who advised kings. They were the men wise kings turned to for counsel and advice. Those wise men knew the prophecy about the baby Jesus. And when they saw the star in the sky, they wanted to come and see the child they believed to be the promised Messiah, the King of the Jews. The first person they visit was the actual King of the Jew, Herod. While the wise men were eager to see and worship the new king, Herod was upset. He didn't like hearing that a new king had been born because Herod was afraid someone would try to overthrow him. Herod wasn't about to give up his throne. In fact, when he found out the wise men had gone home another way, he attempted to find Jesus and kill him. There was nothing Herod could do to stop what Jesus had come to do. Jesus is the king of kings. He is God's son. Even as a baby, he had more power in his tiny hands than Herod ever known. Foolish men like Herod feared him. But if we were wise, we would recognize his power and make him our king. I don't know any of us can fully grasp of what happened on the first Christmas. Jesus was no ordinary baby. He was divine. He was the son of God. As an adult, Jesus would heal the sick and the disabled. He would give sight to the blind. He would raise the dead back to life. Kings had armies and authority, but Jesus held the power of the entire universe in his hand. What's truly unbelievable is how Jesus laid down his power to give his life for us. Jesus willingly allowed the Roman governor and the Jewish leaders to arrest him and put him on trial, beat him, and put him to death. He could have called an army of angels to his rescue and lay waste to those who did not believe in him. That's not why he came. Jesus loved us. And he knows the only way to save us was to die for us. Jesus died for everyone. He died for you and for me, your mom and dad, your grandma and grandpa's aunts and uncles and cousins. He died for the wise men. He died for the men who arrested him, the men who beat him, the soldiers who nailed him to the cross. He even died for King Herod. It's sad that so many people like King Herod rejected him. They may not be kings, but they are rulers of their own lives. They don't want to give control to a God they cannot see. They don't have the faith to trust in someone greater than themselves. I pray that no one here will choose that path. I pray that all of you will be like the wise men. I hope all of you will follow the star to the manger so you can see what God has done for us. You will never find a king with the incredible powers of Jesus. And you will never find anyone who loves you more. Jesus laid down his powers to save us. That is why we celebrate him. That is why wise men still seek him. Dear Jesus, I pray who's all watching and who's all listening and who are looking for you. I pray that they come to you and ask you to be part of their life. Amen. Thanks for coming and joining us. Make sure to come back next week for part four of the Incredible Christmas.